Our guest tonight is an expert on the art of political campaigning and the role of the media in Western democracies. Shanto Ayenga is a lecturer in communications and political science at Stanford University and a visiting professor at the United States Studies Study Center at the University of Sydney. Sixteen years ago, he wrote a book called Going Negative about the falling standard of political discourse, and it's only got worse since then. Professor Ainga says there's a big incentive for politicians, including Australian MPs, to run negative campaigns because that's more newsworthy. Shanto Ainga joins us now in the studio. Welcome to The Drum. Thanks. When did things go negative, as you wrote in your, in your book? Well, in the United States, things have been going negative for quite a while, probably from the early 1980s on. Uh, Roger Ailes was considered the pioneer. He was a Republican consultant. He's now the head of the Fox Network. And he worked with Ronald Reagan back in the That's 80s, right. is that right? That's right. So the Republicans were sort of the pioneers, but the Democrats caught up pretty fast. Why, why, why were the Democrats behind? Why did the Republicans take the lead on this one? Well, it was just a new idea that you could sort of spend most of the time on the campaign attacking the opponent rather than promoting yourself. The conventional approach in the 60s and 70s was simply to say good things about yourself. So does it work? Well, it depends on what you mean. Uh, Does it get votes? It, Does it help it, you get over the line? The, the, there's a big difference between uh, American politics and Australian politics in the sense that we have voluntary voting. Mm. Uh, and so one of the goals of negative campaigning is to keep people from voting. So if you uh, cast the other candidate as a sleazeball, and if the, the people who are not affiliated with a party, uh, we have quite a few people who call themselves independents, they're neither Democrat nor Republican, if they come away with the conclusion that both the candidates are crooks, why should they vote? So it's counterproductive, isn't it, for politicians because it's damaging their brand? Well, but in the United States, uh, if I'm running for office, I simply, uh, uh, I'm, I'm quite happy if three people vote and I get two votes because I'm in. Okay, explain then why there's negative campaigning in Australia where we have compulsory voting. Well, the only thing I can think of in Australia, it, it's not going to affect turnout, obviously, but it's going to affect the ability of the candidate to make the news cycles. Uh, bad news is inherently newsworthy. Uh, you know, planes that land safely don't get covered. Uh, planes that crash, uh, that's, that's big news. Even uh, Baptist pastors seem to get involved in negative uh, politics in the U.S., and we've seen the situation <laughs> in the last week where Mitt Romney has been... Uh, I guess verbal in a sense by uh, the Reverend who introduced Rick Perry at, a, at, a, at an open. He, he endorsed him and introduced him at a, a speech. What did you make of those comments where he basically referred to Mitt Romney's uh, religious beliefs, Mormonism, as a cult? Well, uh, Romney's had this problem for a while. I mean, he, he hasn't. He, he didn't become a Mormon recently, and mm. so the idea about evangelicals—they're uh, very active in the Republican Party and they're very conservative. Uh, both in terms of their theology and their ideology, and so the fact that he's a Mormon is clearly an issue for that. And do you think the Democrats may use that if Romney becomes the, the Republican nominee? Well, I think the Democrats are worried that, that, that Romney might well be the nominee. He's the most centrist, he's the most sort of moderate of the Republicans, and probably the one who's going to give Obama... Uh, probably going to be you know, the best one for the money. Richard Dennis in Canberra's got a question for you. Richard? Yeah, look, I, I mean, you brought up the issue of the media. There's no doubt that it's, it's much quicker to uh, attack your opponent than it is to explain your own policy agenda. Um, given that the media have sort of facilitated this shift towards the negative, do you think there's anything that Australians can learn, either from America or elsewhere, about how, how the media might help to, to move the debate back to actual issues rather than, you know, who's got the best insult of the day? Oh, yes. I think there's several things that Australians could do to avoid some of the mistakes that uh, we have, uh, the American media have sort of carried out over the past few years. One of the things that American media do, which is completely counterproductive, is to examine the TV commercials run by the candidates. So we have a brand new genre of journalism called ad watching. So a candidate runs an ad and the New York Times will run a story critiquing the ad. And all that does really is recycle the candidate's message because no one remembers the fact that there was a critique. They simply remember the more sort of controversial angles of the ad that get critiqued. Uh, Professor, I was thinking really negative campaigning is a sort of a backlash against propaganda, the propaganda of totalitarian regimes. And the modern journalist takes it, and I was one, uh, takes it upon themselves to be that uh, critic and to be the skeptic as a defence against propaganda. But the human being is also essentially a hopeful creature. I mean, otherwise, why would you get out of bed? Uh, and I wonder, 
why, whether you think that it, uh, really effective, the most effective campaigns, whilst they have elements of negativity, as I think we found in the New South Wales election, we also had to provide messages of hope and solutions, or they just found that negativity uh, in the end a turn off. Well, that's an interesting point. It really depends on the state of mind of the electorate. In the United States, we have a very cynical electorate. Mm. Uh, the stereotypes of elected officials are downright negative. Are the okay? approval, the approval rating of the Congress is something like you know 15 percent. Are we down there with And so, person? when you have a negative stereotype, it's much easier to believe information that is consistent with the stereotype. Yes. So, if I'm an American politician and I say, "Vote for me," I'm a brilliant scholar. I'm a Rhodes Scholar. I've got this idea and that idea. People are going to laugh, and they'll say, "Sure." I'm interested in what you said about voluntary voting, compulsory voting, because we have uh, we have compulsory here. Mm -hmm. You have, mm -hmm. I think your turnouts are less than half now at oh, presidential yes. oh, elections. Yeah. Um, I've always thought that because we have a very large number of people who are completely disconnected from the political debate, who really just listen to occasional news bulletins, occasional television, but they still vote, that a lot of that negative campaigning is directed at them and that, that in fact, having our system lends itself to more negative campaigning and, and more dumbing down of the debate because that's all they hear. They hear a little bit and maybe the last thing they heard before they go to the polling booth will influence them one way or the other. What's, what's well, your thought on that in terms of the compulsory system versus voluntary? Well, it's actually, the compulsory and voluntary is one big difference, but, but you also have a system where people are voting basically for a party brand. Mm. They're not voting for the person. Yes. In the United States, we have a completely decentralized system where people vote for the candidates. And, you, you know, a Republican or a Democrat who gets elected doesn't necessarily have to vote with his party. In fact, we have cases where people have been elected as Democrats and the next day they've turned around and said, I'm no longer a Democrat, I'm now a Republican. Whereas in Australia, voters know they're voting for one, one or another alternative government. Exactly. So perhaps that's why they are more responsive to positive messages about what we'll do, because they know that's their only choice. Yeah. What we'll do versus what they'll do. Right, and it's sort of, you know, you're, you're voting for a team, yes. you're not just voting for an individual. Yeah. Yeah. I, think, I think here we, we actually, probably in this country, Go back to 1993 when Paul Keating knocked off Fight Back. Fight Back was the most comprehensive policy document seen. Paul Keating used that line about it being a long suicide note, which now Tony Abbott's using, mm. about the carbon tax. But then he ran a, a relentlessly negative campaign and got himself re-elected in 93 without really having much having of a policy to fly with. No. Well, you know, they had their history. Yeah. Their record. That's right. Yeah, yes. they did. Have you seen that negativity that you identified in your book, Going Negative, back in the 90s, imported into Australia? I know you've only been here for a short time, but have you seen those kind of elements? Well, my impression is that uh, Mr Abbott seems quite adept at crafting sound bites that have a sort of shock value. Uh, which, uh, yeah, and that's the whole logic of negative campaigning, is to sort of say something that's somewhat outrageous, but which gets the attention of the mainstream press. Uh, and so my impression is that he's, he's, he's quite effective at that. Um, now, I want to just make a point about uh, negative campaigning in the United States. Now, it seems to me, from what I've seen in this country, is that when you say <coughs> going negative, you're referring to essentially a sort of a criticism that's based on substantive policy-related disagreements, or perhaps on the question of, uh, so this debate about the carbon tax, for instance. In the United States these days, uh, going negative more often than not means a direct personal attack. Yes, yeah, sure. Often about matters that are completely private, uh, which have nothing the, to do with public service. We saw the... And I think there's a difference. Yeah, there is. And I think in this country yeah. that would be considered out of bounds. Sure. Yes. While on, on the issue we just had a carbon tax go through the lower house mm -hmm. of the parliament here, in the U.S., of course, um, the cap-and-trade system was rejected in, in, in the Congress in the U.S. Can you ever see that getting up in the near future? Oh, no, no. Uh, the on, 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 in questions of the, the environment, uh, we are considerably behind the rest of the world. I mean, there are quite a few people who believe that uh, climate change isn't, isn't real. There are quite a few people who, who, who are in a state of denial. So you could see other countries you know, moving to cap-and-trade and, and the U.S. lagging behind that for, for a long time? For sure. Okay, and just finally, media polarisation. Um, you know, we've seen a lot of that in the US with Fox News and, and then also um, and MSNBC. What impact has that had on politics? Well, the American public is now, is now quite polarised. Uh, the example that I like to use is, uh, is a survey question that we ask people on a regular basis. How would you feel, let's say we ask this question in Australia, how would you feel if your son or daughter, if you're a supporter of the Liberal Party, how would you feel if your son or daughter married someone from the Labour Party? My guess is it would be uh, less than 10% of the population would feel upset. 
Or it is pleased. The United okay. States, it's a one third. That's really interesting. I'm sorry we've run out of time. We could keep talking forever, yes, but we we'll could. have we'll have to leave it there. Thanks to all our panelists, and we'll see you at the same time tomorrow night.